Okay, Christina. Thanks, Alice. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Please put something in the in the chat if you can't. Um, welcome uh, to the Edinburgh Architectural Association event, Introduction to Hygrothermal Analysis. I feel like I've practiced saying that word quite a few times now and still can't get it right, so apologies. Uh, my name is Christina Gager. I am the current president of the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland, the RIS. Um, and I'm also a trustee of the EAA, the Edinburgh Architectural, uh, Architectural Association, sorry, struggling for my words. Um, and it's great to see this event happening tonight, um, a bit more of a technical event, although it is an introduction to. Um, and I think, you know, it really takes its place because the environmental crisis that we're finding ourselves in at the moment means that there's a real kind of urgent need essentially for us to insulate our buildings and that there are, you know, we need to face the challenges in the scale um, of this task, especially given the time period in which we have to undertake the work. Um, and I'm sure if any of you are following the work of the RIS at the moment, um, know that I'm a very, really big advocate for holistic professional led approach to retrofit um, and the importance of our existing existing building stock. Um, there are also, however, technical challenges that go alongside this. And for example, the introduction of internal wall insulation to traditional solid stone walls can upset the natural balance of moisture movement within walls and cause condensation. So I think as architects, we're familiar with terms such as U values and condensation risk analysis. However, this is a relatively simple calculation that maybe doesn't take into account the complexity of water movement within vapor permeable constructions. Uh, and this was kind of the, the premise on why the EAA wanted to look at um, hydrothermal analysis and, and why they think we should know more about it. So I'm very pleased to welcome our three speakers tonight. Um, Joseph Little is Assistant Head of School at Dublin School of Architecture. Um, Technological University Dublin, and his areas of research include energy efficiency renovation of modern and traditionally built buildings and hydrothermal risk evaluation as a key tool in guiding specifications and designs for low risk, high performance. Now, some of his research has been published by the uh, HES and, and their technical papers, which I think will be touched on this evening. Um, and Joseph will discuss the building physics of heat and moisture movement in solid walls and how the hydrothermal analysis is a more accurate model for predicting the effect of additional insulation. Then we have Roger Curtis, who's technical manager at Historic Environment Scotland, chartered building surveyor and very experienced in the repair and conservation of traditional and historic structures. Um, Historic Environment Scotland, HES, have a considerable body of research into ways of enhancing the thermal performance of historic buildings, and some of you may be familiar with, with that. Uh, Roger will talk about the recent research and characteristics of different stone types, which will help inform hydrothermal analysis. Um, and our, our last but not least speaker, of course, is Chris Morgan, who's a director at John Gilbert Architects, with considerable experience in ecological design and sustainable development. And John Gilbert Architects are an authority on the practical installation of retrofit within Scotland. And Chris has recently authored the Sustainable Renovation Guide with Historic Environment Scotland for the Pebble Trust. And Chris will talk about and touch on recent experiences of hydrothermal analysis on a retrofit project um, in Glasgow, I believe. So each speaker tonight will talk for around 15 to 20 minutes on their work, no pressure for each of them. Um, and then we'll get the opportunity to take questions from the floor. If anyone thinks of any questions uh, during any of the, the discussions, you know, pop them in the chat and I'll keep an eye on them as we go through uh, and pick them up at the end. So please do post questions in the, in the box uh, for the events team and myself to, to put to the panel. Okay, so without further uh, ado and, and any more wittering from me, uh, I'll, we'll start the evening with Joseph Little. Thank you very much, Joseph. Good evening. You're, you're very welcome. Um, delighted to be here. Um, I, I, have a, I think I have a special association at this stage with, with Scotland and historic environment Scotland in particular since Roger um, got interested in my work back in 2010. I've been over to see you many times and um, it's great to see what's gone on over there and how we can help each other and so on. Um, I'm just going through, I'm just uh, setting up my presentation One second. I, I want to unshare it before I share it as it were. Uh, I close that and show, that's what I want to do. Okay, so I want to start it again. 
and I think I can share it over here. So one moment. And the speaker view, recording, share. There we are, share screen. Okay, sorry. Um, could I just have a little bit of help here? Yeah, This sure. worked fine yesterday. <laughs> I'm okay. clicking on the share screen button. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, fine. Yep. And it should be that screen. It should be that screen there. Yeah, it's fine, share. Yes. Now, do I get a pleasing, I don't get a pleasing rectangle around it, but I think you're, you're seeing, hopefully you're seeing the same thing. Yeah, no, that's working now, Joseph. Great. Okay, so you should be just seeing the, the presentation, nothing else. Yeah? Yeah, and you. Yeah. <laughs> and me. Okay, well, that's a different thing, isn't it? Fine. Yes. But you're you're not seeing a big black screen around it or anything silly? No. Your screen sharing? Yeah. It, it looks it looks absolutely fine, Joseph. Fine. Okay, grand sizes. Great. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so, um, I am looking at some of the building physics issues uh, around... Um, about around it renovating buildings. I'm not particularly talking tonight tonight about solid wall buildings, but everything I'm saying is applicable to solid wall buildings. The examples I'm showing are actually to do with solid wall buildings, but I think it's very important to say that risk assessment, um, hydrothermal risk assessment is relevant to super low insulated new builds. It's relevant to uh, roofs, green roofs. It's relevant to a wide range of timber frame or even cavity wall or full fill cavity uh, type conditions. It's not relevant only to historic buildings. Um, sometimes that may get a little bit lost. Um, whoops. Okay, that wasn't good. My apologies. Oh, I'll go again. Here we go. So that should be the first one. Fine. Sorry about that. Now, there is um, a lot still, of what I'll be... Sorry, Joseph, you're still not sharing. Okay. My apologies. It should be... It should be that screen there. Share and then share that. There we go. Okay. Are we right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Apologies. Now, um, a lot of what I'll be referencing today comes from technical paper 15 which was a big project, probably bigger than we intended it to be. Our, our historic Scotland at the time realized it would be. It's effectively three studies in one. The first part of it addresses, well, what is building? What is applied building physics? So we're not scientists. We're not scientists and we're not expecting you to be, but we do need to engage with the world of applied building physics. So what is that? What's, what's relevant to solid wall buildings? The second part is, well, what are the standards that relate to that and what's the guidance there and um, which are more applicable? And, and in fact, which maybe we shouldn't be using at all, which we commonly do use in the industry. And then the third part is, um, here's a case study, let's look at that and let's see how we can explore those issues, those applied building physics aspects we talked about and those standards and tools uh, through an example of a particular building in Glasgow. And it was a Glasgow tenement that we looked at, a, a solid stone wall building. And um, I think there's still relevance there. One thing that's very important about the document, it was written for architects, building design specifiers. Um, it wasn't written, again, like I said, for scientists, but it was also written in the context of a lot of unknown and unfortunately, when we're dealing with risk, there are always unknowns. That's in the nature of the beast. But also the government, I would say, certainly um, the Dublin, the Irish government, and possibly the Whitehall government you have, has not supported you uh, or us very well. I would say the Scottish government, in the context of Historic Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland, has probably done a better job as a as a uh, regional government, if that's the right word to use. Um, they have shown outstanding leadership, I would say. Uh, but there's still an awful lot to be uh, uh, understood, known, disseminated, taught, upskilled uh, in the space. But I think this is a, a very useful document. It is it is weighty, uh, but there's lots of really good stuff in it, and hopefully it's accessible to uh, building design professionals. Now, building physics is complex, that's true, but it's also well understood. And frequently people talk about building physics as if it's voodoo, or as if the building physics relating to an existing building or a traditional building is different than relating to a modern building and so on. That, that's nonsense. Building physics is building physics. Um, um, we actually know an awful lot, but unfortunately the level of knowledge out there in the industry can often be poor. Standards in the past were poor. Um, um, 
and uh, we've we've often used old rules of thumb and and bad guidance and and also inappropriate tools and and some of those tools have been promoted to us many many times so there's a range of things we need to overcome but the billing physics itself is well understood there are now many um, software tools that can help us, but there's also traditional methods, you know, on-site surveying and the skills that you have as building design professionals, which are all available and are useful. Uh, so it's, 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 it's worth not magnifying it beyond what it needs to be, but it's also worth understanding. If we ask for something different, if we seek a different goal, we shouldn't expect the old path to still um, get us there. But at the same time, maps are still maps you know and good boots and and and, and, a, and a good overcoat are still good boots and a good overcoat etc um one thing to say is that uh, most energy efficiency renovation in scotland and england and ireland and so on has been done without any moisture risk assessment and often done as we know without architects um when i gave a presentation a number of years ago in either edinburgh i think it was edinburgh um i, I came across this image on a Power, a presentation on somebody's website very proudly presented um, as work that was being funded by the Scottish government and uh, to me it looks automatically appalling but it was interesting that the, those people who put this on their website were very pleased with this and it means your taxpayers money is often being misspent and often the government is setting standards that can be higher standards than is reasonable now there's been lots of progress in that direction uh, when I started talking about this there were there were a lot of standards that were being asked for that were too high. And I think recent changes, particularly since 2016, are looking really positive and, and really great guidance coming out of the UK and particular organizations like Historic Environment Scotland, the STBA, the UK Centre for Moisture Buildings, etc. Um, I think one thing we need to acknowledge in the architecture profession is that we are perceived uh, and this is true of, from both islands, not to care about time, not to care about money and not to care about risk. Uh, yet we control mo much of the specification. And sometimes I don't think we understand how much we control. Insulation suppliers, building suppliers really understand how much we control. But often we'll say, no, but the client might want a cheaper option. But actually, even in that context of what are those choices and what are those geometries and what are those approaches being taken, we're actually even guiding those things. Um, so there's there's an awful lot that we, we control, but sometimes we don't own that and we don't... Um, perhaps think enough about how the industry has reconfigured. So the construction industry has been reconfiguring around risk management, increased complexity of projects and procurement innovation, an agenda to which architects have been largely unable to contribute or shape. Now this, this, this finding is from the RIBA. Uh, it's a document that they published about architects in Britain, uh, or certainly in England, I'm not sure about the Scottish element of it. Uh, for most clients, cost certainty and program performance come before design quality. The apparent separation of architectural design concerns from these major client concerns has reduced architects' traction as advocates of design quality. A significant proportion of clients tend not to believe that looking after their risk, money and, and time is, an is in an architect's DNA. However clever they may be at getting uh, value out of sites through the planning process or its stylish and functional design. And that's something we should be very aware of, and, and it, particularly when it comes to specification, um, where that design becomes real, we should be all over. We should be masters of specification and, and why we're doing something and why it's in the client's interest and their health and, and, and their, their uh, future uh, economic gain or you know, values. So in understanding risk, um, you know, what's the most risky thing you'll do today? Probably getting out of bed because an awful lot of things follow from that. But if you don't get out of bed, there could be other problems, too. Um, you know, uh, wh when is risk evaluation reasonable or necessary? Uh, well, actually, most of the time, um, if, if there's minor consequences and um, there, there is little uncertainty, yes, you know, there's no reason to, to risk evaluate. But in all other situations, actually, there is. Now, the risk evaluation, the conclusion could be, yes, I need to open that document. And in the document, there's prescriptive guidance. That could actually be your path of risk evaluation. And, and, that, and as long as that's an appropriate path, that's fine. And there's lots of guidance out there which, which can be dealt with prescriptively. But there's also lots of cases where we need to actually um, do something that's bespoke. And we just need to understand that and understand that most of the cases we're addressing in building specification do, in, it do involve some level of risk and, and we need to know how we're addressing it. If you looked at that in a different way, you could start scoring it. You can have 
you know, severity by likelihood uh, multiplied by likelihood equals your risk. In other cases, you'll see, you know, C plus P equals R. There's lots of different variations on this. It's, it, it's, it's, it's quite loose in a way, and that's okay, because really what we're trying to understand is, are we deep green? Are we somewhere in the middle? Are we actually moving into red? And we don't even know it. And I've come across many, many architects who have no idea that they've actually just got into space boots. They've actually launched themselves into orbit. They're using a building system for which there's no support using uh, to a level of performance they're looking for, which is which is uncovered anywhere else. And they're now floating out there in the outer space um, without any awareness that they've just done that. Um, so we need to be really aware. And there's lots of construction products being placed out in the market these days, which have don't have a trade association, don't have um, experience, or you're told, oh, it works in America. There's seven or eight years of it working in America or wherever. Um, but, you know, that could be a different climate. There's at least five different climates in the United States of America. There is many different microclimates in, in the British Isles, as, as we know, um, and they can be very, very different. Our, our concerns, our causes could be highly elevated relative humidity, low drying and horizontal wind. I mean, they could be horizontal rain. They could be some of our biggest issues here. They're very, very different issues than um, excessive drying or incredibly cold temperatures or, or huge changes, oscillations in temperature from one to the other. These are other sorts of issues that present other challenges for other climates. And we shouldn't simply accept something that works in Frankfurt or works in Washington as being applicable to Edinburgh or Dublin or, or uh, Cardiff. Um, this is in a similar kind of vein. This is a risk evaluation some of you may have come across from The Guardian in two, early 2020, which referred to a um, secret study at the time for the government in Whitehall, uh, where they uh, somebody identified that the likelihood of an influenza type pandemic um, would be catastrophic, and it was also of moderate likelihood. And um, this was obviously put before your government. It wasn't something I think my government knew about or was thinking about in um, early 2019. And we all know about that now. So a risk evaluation is no use if it's not put into action. Um, there are other things there about nuclear or, or terrorists and all sorts of other things, but it is interesting that it was actually flagged as being of moderate likelihood and, and, and also catastrophic. Um, a different type of, of example um, is, is this one here, looking at, again, actually a COVID for a moment. Um, and we're talking in both cases, we're talking about a landscape of risk. And I, I'm, re I'm doing that for a reason that um, unlike looking at, let's say, a U-value calculation or a thermal model um, or point, you know, some, some element that is knowable to a very high degree of certainty, and you can talk about second and third decimal places and so on, when you're talking about risk, you're not in that space. You're really in a, in a space of greys and landscapes of risk, and it's really important to identify where you are. And very quickly in society, we can see that the people in green, who are the healthcare workers, are much higher at risk than the blue people, which are all the people who are not healthcare workers. And you can also see that a CEO appears in quite a happy position, being very well paid and reasonably low risk. But some, as soon as you start dealing with uh, the public more often, or you, you deal with specific health issues, and our, our, our sad GP is up here, quite well paid, uh, apparently, but at very high risk and so on. So, so just as an analogy, it's, it's good to think of that, that. Where are we in this landscape of risk? That's what we're looking for in terms of our moisture risk assessment of, of an existing building. This is a, a very quick graph, I'm, I'm not expecting you to take it in, or a table, where we looked for, uh, for um, at timber frame systems, timber frame assemblies for a company called Quilsha, which is the Irish word for forests, uh, the Gaelic word for forests. And we were looking at different types of um, um, assemblies that they might use, and, and those assemblies might be located in different parts of Europe. So we, we were looking at a range of exposure zones, we were looking at a range of different construction types, or, or sorry, you know, st narrow stud, wide stud, um, different levels of air tightness, different levels of, of imperfection, um, different types of membranes or, or racking boards with different characteristics in them. And I suppose what I'm showing you is all of these little rectangles could represent a, a study that would be carried out. Um, but the ones that we chose are the ones that are, are colored. Um, I should actually say that incorrectly. All, all of the lines are different assessments that we could choose to do, uh, but we didn't need to do all of them. And it's, it's about understanding the landscape of risk, uh, in this case, the landscape of parameters to lead to a risk assessment, and then choosing from that what is necessary and, 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 and affordable, which is always an issue. One thing I'm really, I, I find a fascinating concept, which I don't think gets talked about enough, is the difference between precision and accuracy. Um, there is a great 
uh, can p potential for somebody to present. And I've already had this experience of being opposite somebody in a, in a law court and they put a graph on the table from, from Woofy and it's a beautiful graph and it makes you feel very comfortable. There's a nice warm feeling looking at this graph. It's an oscillating graph that, that does its own thing forever and it's well below thresholds that you would be concerned about. Um, but it's cooked, it's rubbish. Um, and, and, and just, you know, no, you know um, peanuts in, peanuts out, or, or, you know, if somebody wants to play a game, they can play a game. It's incredibly important that there's rigor in how assessments are made. And it's incredibly important that we look for accuracy. And sometimes we accept that we may have low precision uh, if you look at the uh, arrow, the, the dartboard below there in the bottom left, that we could be looking at low precision, but high accuracy. Um, that's, a, that's, that's, it's better to have high precision and high accuracy, but we should accept sometimes that we are in that world because for instance, governments haven't given us climate files. For instance, um, organizations haven't done enough measuring of, of materials. You'll hear later today that Roger Curtis in Historic Environment Scotland is doing that kind of work and that's fantastic um, with Philip Banfield. But um, the danger is that somebody says, oh, I, I've used this fancy software and because it's fancy, it must be right. And uh, it's expensive and, and uh, it's difficult and I could do it. And here, here's the graph that proves everything's fine. And I've chosen one material here, one material here, and I've got this pleasing graph. And, and really they're giving you something that might be high precision where they're clustering around a particular value, but the, the accuracy is very, very low. That's nonsense, that's noise, it's, it's uh, useless and dangerous even. So just be very careful, there's a difference. And, and it was the, the first of those that we were trying to help people towards with uh, the, H, the technical paper 15. And there's an awful lot of other studies to help us in that direction. So obviously um, surveying is, 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 has never ceased to be an important activity. Uh, looking at the rainwater goods is, is kind of often where you start looking at those indicative cracks and so on, settlement. Um, there's Karsten tube measurement, which you can see in the bottom two images, which we've done very successfully. It, there are more sophisticated ways of measuring absorptivity of water in a driving rain event. That's what we're trying to uh, simulate here, or try to uh, uh, replicate here, I should say. But those 10 tubes I'm using on the wall, and it's described in Appendix 2 of uh, Technical Paper 15 in detail, um, is a very, very clever way, non-invasive way of getting a really strong sense of how this wall compares to that wall. And you, there could be a hundred uh, a unit of 100 in the difference between the absorptivity levels going on, or uh, in, I shouldn't say absorptivity actually, sorry, I should be saying it's rainwater absorptivity, it's, it's liquid water I'm talking about, it's capillarity rather than vapour, uh, but there could be a difference uh, in measurement of 100 between one and the other. So really, really worth uh, looking at, and these tubes cost about six pounds each, um, and they're available uh, from I think Stormguard and other, other manufacturers, um, and, and I used a white tack or plasticine to apply them to the walls. But there's a nice rigorous method that you can use and you can be, make better choices then, therefore, from let's say simulation, as to which material we're going to start this assessment with. Obviously, we live in different parts of the British Isles. It's a, it's a very, very windy uh, part of maritime Europe. And all those issues I mentioned before about poor drying and, and, and strong winds, driving rain are concerns, but there are significantly more concerns in you know, Glasgow or west of Glasgow uh, or, or in Galway or, or North Donegal than they are, let's say, in Cambridge. Um, and, 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 but, but even then locally, the head of a valley could have some local conditions which make a difference to somewhere else in what's otherwise, uh, you know, a windy area, but a sheltered location given, you know, tree belts or other sorts of conditions. And we need to have some awareness of that. We always need to be building in capacity and caution, but we need to be aware of where we are and the tools we use should, should help us with that. There is obviously a lot of guidance out there from the government. BS 5250 uh, is being revised at the moment. This is the 2016 edition. Um, it was a big improvement on what came before, but uh, there's a significant, very positive change happening now. And obviously that, that, that uh, relates to part uh, C and part L of your building regulations. There's lots of other guidance that I think have helped drive the building regulations. So the STBA, the Sustainable Traditional Building Alliance and the UK Centre for Moisture and Buildings have done extraordinary work in the last few years alongside, like I said, Historic Scotland. Um, this document on the left started a lot in terms of looking at systemic effects, looking at buildings as complex systems, not just isolated walls and floors and, and other conditions, and looking at how people interact with those. So they started talking about this and setting out these kind of principles. The knowledge guidance wheel you see there then took that a lot further, and it's a fascinating tool, and not a lot of people realise that there's actually a, a large database of peer-reviewed material behind that. There's a library behind that free guidance wheel. So it's a funny graphic thing to play with initially and you could get your client involved with playing on those different little uh, grey um, 
uh, circles. You can you can interface with it. It's a nice little graphical interface. But then behind it is a library that's useful. The solid wall insulation guide, the Bristolian guide, it was excellent and followed from those uh, that kind of guidance and uh, again has has relevance to Scotland. Um, and then the moisture and buildings uh, document was commissioned by the British Standards Institute. Has is 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 a white paper for for influencing government policy, and is a superb piece of work by Chris Sanders, who was a retired professor from Glasgow Caledonian, and Neil May, who very sadly passed away uh, two years ago. And then the Bonfield Review uh, from the government side, I suppose, highlighted the problems with the Green Deal and and with poorly thought out renovation. So there's a lot of clustering of really good guidance coming from the university sector, from research, from private bodies, not for profits, that are now influencing the government. Um, you, the point, you're, the reason you're here tonight is because you're sitting at your desk. Uh, I doubt you've got a May line or a, or a T square uh, these days, but you may have. Uh, but you're looking for guidance, and and the the, the natural process, process you're meant to take is is to go to approved document C, as I, as I understand it. Moving on to um, a code of practice, perhaps the code of practice for control of moisture in buildings, um, um, and then. The, the version from 2016 was the first time ever, despite the fact that Stan, the Woofie has been around since 2007, it was the first time that um, that 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 this mentioned it, that the, the BS 5250 mentioned it. And it talks about four types of guidance and it's BSE, BSEN 15026 2007 that refers to Woofie. I'm just wondering, am I out of time? Is that no? Okay, I heard some there ringing a few, there. Few moments left, Joseph. Fine, thanks, Christina. Sorry. Now, just to say, BS five two five zero is 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 very interesting in the in the change. So we're looking at this document here. Um, if I can circle, I don't know if you can see that the the that 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 has now been changed in the context of the moisture and buildings document, and that's that's a really really positive step. Um, so you're going to start being asked as architects looking at traditional buildings not to justify why you're relaxing or you know relaxing your U values to put in a sensible value of let's say 0.55 or 0.6 or even 0.7 uh, in your internal insulation strategy for your solid wall. Instead of being forced to justify that uh, and then being told, well, there's a grant aid if you go for this more onerous value, uh, you know, a lower U value, um, you're, it's, I understand it's going to start from the principle, well, that's a safe position. And now you have to justify why you want to go to the more onerous uh, the, the 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 higher level of insulation, the lower U value, and I think that's a very interesting kind of step change there. Um, it will follow the the white paper that I mentioned. It won't just deal with interstitial and so, uh, and and uh, surface condensation, but it'll also deal with moisture mechanisms, in particular rainwater penetration and ground water issues. It'll cover connective and systemic issues. So how you know a higher population in the house, a greater use of a power shower. Well, not surprisingly, the moisture load within the building is now higher than it was before. The climate outside maybe hasn't changed, maybe it is, but let's say assume it hasn't. But now the load on that solid wall is significantly higher than before. And what might not have failed before is now failing. Or where there was not mold before, now there is. All those sorts of things where, where one thing it connects and, and affects another. Um, it'll also address as built in service conditions, which means real conditions, not as designed theoretical conditions, which are lovely and beautiful with perfect air tightness and, and no driving rain and, and no orientation in particular. Um, but instead it's actually starting saying, well, look, this building is real and it's lived in and it has conditions and it's not perfect. Now, how do we address those things? Um, so all will be considered with regard to both fabric uh, moisture and atmospheric moisture, um, and also looking at durability and occupant health, which of course it must do, it should do, but this has not been as present in guidance before. So the, this document, I believe the, the revised BS5250 is coming out this year. Um, it'll also be aligned with the each home counts, which you saw earlier on the Bonfield review. It'll be aligned with past 2030 and past 2035. So really significant, really joined up guidance coming from the government after I suppose several years of lobbying from people, I suppose like myself, like Roger Curtis, like Neil May and Chris Sanders and others saying, can we do this better? Uh, so training will be necessary. There'll be professional qualifications to be developed for implementation um, and to make sure that it's, it's, it's more, you know, the processes are more robust and hopefully not more, more complicated. Uh, so I'm going to go quickly through this. 
This is the Glazer method. It's a very simple method. If you have a building that complies with the scope of the standard um, BSEN 13788, page four of that document, if you've ever opened it, shows the scope. And if your building complies with that, this is a reasonably good method. But this method has been used as the only method for risk assessing all buildings in, in, in absence of another and in absence of BS5250 referring to, to, to Woofie or um, the Delphin or other um, appropriate numerical simulation tools. And numerical means that it's calculating at each step. Um, there, it, it, it's, it's, it's transient in that it's hourly. It's not dynamic, but it's, it's changing over hours. These calculation cells change. Uh, one solves, and then this influences this, and then this is solved, and this influences this, and backwards and forwards, and so on over this period of time you're looking at. And it's a simulation. It's not reality, but it's, it's, it's an attempt. It's a simplified attempt at getting close to reality. Um, so I'll talk to you more about that in a moment. If we looked at the Glazer method, and we looked somewhere off Scotland, um, um, and, 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 and use that method, which like I said, has been the dominant method since uh, the, even the 50s or so, even before, for a building with high internal occupancy, it could be shown that a wall made of two layers of plasterboard uh, with 350 millimeters of internal wall insulation facing the North Sea in, in Lerick or Lerick in, in Shetland uh, will pass a Glazer method evaluation if there's a VCL on the room side. And this is absolute nonsense because obviously a wall of plasterboard will collapse within a few months uh, of, of, of normal weather in, 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 in most of the UK or, or Ireland, um, but it'll actually pass. So it's an assessment that's dangerously foolish. We know it's foolish in this case, but that's then being applied in other cases. And just to prove that, here's the interface. So we're looking there with a building, a dwelling with high occupancy at the top. We can see the assembly has the two layers of plasterboard, the 350 millimeters of internal insulation. There's a membrane which you can barely see, but it's, it is listed. Um, and you can see there's absolutely no accumulation of moisture whatsoever uh, in, this, in this assessment. And, and this is nonsense. And like I said, it's actually dangerous. Um, so the diffusion paradigm is that version of building physics, which explains hydrothermal performance uh, of building envelopes in terms of water vapor diffusion only. And we use a steady state profile methods which lead to recommendations for vapor barriers and attic ventilation, the predisposition towards prescriptive guidance. Uh, this predispos predisposition towards prescriptive guidance inhibited the development of an engineering approach like you might see with fire uh, in, 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 in buildings. Uh, and just to give you an example, the BS5250 in 2011 uh, uh, said that internally applied uh, thermal insulation isolates the heat interior, uh, heated interior from the masonry, this is broadly true, which will therefore be cooler, which is broadly true, producing a risk of interstitial condensation behind the thermal insulation, which may or may not be true, it depends how much insulation, it depends on the type of insulations, uh, etc. And to prevent that, an AVCL should be applied on the warm side of the thermal insulation. That guidance is wrong. That's absolutely appropriate in one case, and it's a really good idea in one case, and it's absolutely the wrong thing to do in another case. But the guides that was being provided uh, in Britain, and therefore followed in Ireland as well, uh, for so many years was of this nature, and that's what they call the diffusion paradigm. You know, every, well, as everyone knows, put a VCL in your grant. That kind of approach, you know, is, is not appropriate to, rule out, to, to roll out across all building types. So the Woofy database, the Woofy, sorry, the Woofy uh, interface, allows very quick use of uh, multiplication of projects of different cases on the left hand side. There's a very easy graphical interface where you can move your, your materials around, delete, replace, change thicknesses, all these things. You can download, you can upload. Um, it, it shows you the hydrothermal values, which are fixed values, like the density or porosity or the thermal conductivity, but then also hydrothermal uh, functions where uh, conductivity changes with temperature or conductivity changes with moisture um, or moisture storage function changes with relative humidity, all these other sorts of things. Um, there are a range of, you know, materials have different characteristics. These are all happen to be German sandstones and limestones. Uh, actually, sorry, they're all sandstones. Um, and you can see, I don't, I'm not, I don't have time to go into it, but you can see that the water absorption is how much it literally, how much the material wicks in water, liquid water during an event, a dry, let's say a driving rain event. And those characteristics are different. It reaches different thresholds. It happens at different speeds. You can see the moisture storage function on the left. Again, you know, one um, takes in moisture slowly, but stores a lot. One takes in moisture quickly, but stores very little and, and, and so on and so forth. So these are different characteristics of materials. It's really useful to understand these. And, and these help us to make a more nuanced and accurate um, um, assessment uh, using a, a, a transient um, simulation tool like, like Woofie or again, like Delphin. 
um, you can take account of where the building is, what, what its exposure is, what its what's the parapeted or, or, or eaved. You can take account of its the inclination of the material. You take account of imperfect workmanship. You can allow for the the, the, the weakening of seals. For what if what would happen if moisture penetrated behind that point at that window reveal junction? What would then happen? What's the risk? Is is it okay? And in some cases it might be fine. In other cases it might be really problematic. Um, you can see in climate files how um, there is variation. The, 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 the pink dots refer to the Glazer um, averaged value. So a single average value for every month in terms of the external ambient temperature. But you can see how the sun comes out. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, it's cloudy, it's nighttime. It's, it's it, you, you know, all sorts of different conditions happen in the blue lines, which represent a closer uh, move to reality. And this is using a synthetic climate file. The, the, the pink dots are incredibly simplified. They tell us very, very little about those kind of natural conditions. The same happens with relative humidity. So when it hits 100%, obviously it's raining, but this can be very, very good drying. And, and, and in between, there can be lots of the normal things that go on. But again, those little pink dots tell us very little. Uh, again, the internal ambient temperature because of solar gain can, and, and, and internal gains can be very, very different. But again, the, the pink dots give us a single straight line uh, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm just going to... Um, tell you that basically historic Scotland Techno Paper 15 has uh, <laughs> has all this good stuff, which I'm not going to go through now, but I'm just really emphasizing that there's, you know, some things are, are reasonably reasonable approximations of reality and other things are absolutely the opposite. Um, and uh, when we did this study, we did it deliberately using Glazer, which you're seeing here, and, and, and our own study using Woofy. And uh, if you look at the green dots, the green dots basically show where Glazer had some level of concurrence with uh, the transient simulation using Woofy. And you can see how many times, how many green dots are missing. Um, there was, there was, you know, there were cases where they were black and white. There was no correlation. It's not simplified. It's not simplified in the sense that it's halfway to fully complex or real. In, at times it can be close to being re reality. At other times it could give you an entirely wrong steer. It could be totally inaccurate. So the last thing I just want to say in terms of training, my last two slides, Christina, you'll be glad to know. Uh, the green register, uh, wh which I've been training with uh, and, and with uh, Christian Bludau from the Fraunhofer Institute for Building Physics, who've invented uh, Woofy, the Woofy Pro software, um, we teach together uh, normally in London uh, in November. And this year we'll be teaching online. Uh, which means that anyone who wants to come from Scotland or indeed Hong Kong, uh, wherever, uh, is willing, is, is able to attend. We're, we're looking at, we're teaching over a week. It'll be, there'll be three workshops. We'll be giving you video lectures. We'll be giving you little bits of homework. So actually we're hoping it actually might be an improved experience than the two full days that we typically gave in London. You can see the cost below. I think the 650s for members of the Green Register and the 700s for non-members, um, but it'll be easy to attend from your office should you wish. And the advantage of this is that it's a week. The, the second, the disadvantage of this is that this is real upskilling, it's academic uh, upskilling, it, 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 you will, it's tested, um, you get a, a hundred learning hours um, and the confidence I'm, I would suggest that you take away from um, the CPT certificate which starts on the 8th of January is, is significant. Um, we, we, we allow you to explore. And I'd say the other thing about this is it's not just about Woofy, whereas the, where this is purely focusing in on the Woofy tool, and, and, and learning to, with a great deal more time than today about all that. Um, this is actually wider. It's looking at the Glazer tool as well. It's looking at, um, you know, we've more time to evaluate. We've more time to, for you to test yourself. We give you more feedback uh, and you get to do a project at the end and so on. So that, that's, that's available as well for those of you that are interested. So thank you very much. I know I'm over time. No, that's no problem, Joseph, at all. I think it's really hard to always interrupt because I was so enraptured with what you were talking about. I didn't, I didn't want you to stop. So it's always a, a difficult compromise. But I think we'll also have time you know, to elaborate a little bit on um, on things at Q&A at the end as well. So thank you for that. That's really appreciated. You're welcome. Um, and just to, to, to move on to our, to our next speaker, uh, Roger Curtis, um, who I believe is probably in the background um, preparing I, I should be here and I'm about to get the share screen thing working. Fantastic, thank you. I can see that now. Right, what have you got chaps? Can you see that? Yeah, I can see exactly the right thing, Roger. Thank you very much. 
Good. OK, so um, a little bit of a research update with a few sort of opinions and, and comment thrown in, really, um, on the hydrothermal question. A fair amount of it will be um, based on our own experience in the, uh, the HES case studies, of which there's now really quite a few. And uh, if I'm clever enough, I'll remember to pick up on a couple of issues that Joseph has mentioned. Let's just remind ourselves of the space we're in, pre-1919, traditionally built. Here's a nice example. This is my sort of go-to imagined cottage. Um, technologically, quite a limited set of a palette of materials. We've been building like this in Scotland, sort of 500 years or so, depending on how you on how you crunch it. And when people tell me every building's different, they're sort of right geometrically, but I would argue that in terms of the technology, there is quite a big um, similarity because in fact, the variation is in scale. So th this is not essentially that different really from, from this one. So I'm comfortable and we're a little bit lucky in having a certain harmony in our structures that maybe other parts of, of the country don't have. Um, and as you all know, we've been dealing quite heavily with energy efficiency for some time. So we've developed a, a palette of interventions um, of which obviously the wall stuff is really what we're interested in today. But just to give you a, a little feeling for the for the scope of it all and how we and how we might apply it. Um, I think by this slide, what I'm trying to show you is that a lot of hydrothermal stuff gets conflated with, with building defects and building defects in traditional buildings that an awful lot of people do not seem to notice um, when in fact you should, because that's what you're being paid for. So it's no uh, surprise that one half of this building is in a good state and one half of the building is not so good. The other fact that's coming down on us, in addition to the hydrothermal effects that Joseph has been discussing, uh, and maybe poor materials choices, and by that I mean, what is this render? To me, it's irrelevant if you're in a windy, uh, wet area of Scotland, if you have an inappropriate material that is prone to cracking. Guess what that might be? But also the climate has changed. We know that parts of Scotland are significantly wetter now than they were before. So in addition to building detailing issues, we have a sheer volume and the wetting and dry drying uh, mechanism, which a lot of traditional materials partly rely on, is, is a little bit broken. And if you add that poor maintenance, uh, poor detailing, and, and I'm afraid I will attack the architectural profession for not appearing to be taught detailing in, uh, in, 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 the, in the educational journey. Um, and if we add in odd materials, odd modern materials, solutions in a tin, quite literally, and every other kind of, of, of stuff off the shelf to make your life easy. Um, we've, we've got an interesting mix. And when we talk about traditional buildings, very few traditional buildings are actually as they were left in the, let's say, late 19th century. They've had interventions, they've had weird paint, they've had different interesting mortars, they've had different types of stone, maybe artificial stone, and everything that goes with it. So I think we've got a, a fairly mixed bag here. Um, but uh, let, let's just remind ourselves of the wall types and, and what we're looking at here. Uh, so on, the, on, on this side, if you can see my mouse, we've got your lath and plaster lined uh, mass wall, probably around 600 thick, maybe 550 by the time of the late 19th century. It could be a windstone, it could be a sandstone and a lime mortar. We've got a similar thing in the middle here, but uh, plastered on the, on the inside and then with a, a form of render on the outside. And then on the far, far side, we've got perhaps a, a less necessarily pre-1919, but perhaps a, a sort of middle one of what is sometimes called a hard to treat cavity, where you have a combination of traditional uh, masonry on the outside skin, but then we have um, various types of brick, probably with the cement. Uh, so this is a, a sort of mixture of building construction technologies. And I would suggest that possibly that is where the care is needed and that is where the hydrothermal measuring and monitoring uh, along the lines of of what joseph is saying is very much in the in the risk management space i'm fairly comfortable with doing things to a mass wall that is doing its vapor thing as it should do in fairly normal uh, conditions with a decent uh, building design and detailing uh, and some traditional materials behaving as i expect but 
it's a different case when you've got um, what I might call a hybrid construction or a, a, an older building that's been intervened with by a lot. And again, the, you, you may have seen this, my favorite slide that I did some years ago now, but um, I, I kind of like it on, on the wetting and drying paradigm and the vapor loading on the inside of a building, which has increased vastly. Uh, and our ventilation habits have changed significantly. Um, now, one of the interesting things about COVID is how we approach and look at ventilation. And I suspect there will be some, some changes there. And, and the wetting line, uh, the liquid boundary line, which I'm referring to here, that shifts and changes depending on the outside conditions. And this is where the modeling comes in, depending on what you're proposing to do, either on the inside face or indeed on the outside face, because uh, EWI is a good place to put the insulation. We just need to check it's right. And that's where some of these modeling tools can come in and help you. So what are we doing about it? Um, ourselves then at Hess and how are we trying to communicate that to you, the professions who are going to be uh, dealing with retrofit at scale in Scotland, almost from the off. Um, in, a, in a purely traditional building, I'm fairly um, comfortable about hydrothermal risk, but that needs to be quantified so that the sector can start to um, appreciate there are a range of um, indicative details or standard details that we can we can utilize on uh, the traditional building palette. Modern, modern construction training, I'm afraid, does not get it. Uh, and conservation is certainly better at it. Um, but I think my second bullet still applies is we have got to quantify it in a way. Um, we've been leading towards it with a lot of pilots now. We've got uh, technical paper 24 describes around 18 traditional buildings where we've done various interventions, mostly internal wall insulation and an analysis and comment of the success of those measures by um, a building surveying uh, company who wrote that up under technical paper 24. So hold that thought uh, for busy people who need to get a summary, that is possibly not a bad document to get your noses into. Um, and again, we need a predictive capability. Um, and this is really where Woofy and some of the other stuff, uh, the models that, that Joseph has mentioned. But the snag with them, is that the standardized inputs, the assumed values, um, are not really representative of Scottish um, building materials, particularly our sandstones and our mortars. And although to some of us a sandstone, a block of sandstone looks like a block of sandstone, they vary very significantly in performance. A lot of you will be familiar with Locker Briggs, the red sandstone from the southwest of Scotland. That is very um, a very open matrix. It'll, it'll physically absorb water quite well and it will shift water vapor very, very effectively. So these are good properties in the right context and, and maybe uh, not quite so good in the other. So as a way of addressing that, we commissioned some lab work, lab work by, uh, by Harriet Watt University um, in 2018, which ran over around a little bit, uh, wet, dry, wet and dry cup tests and thermal transmittance. Uh, so we've got two sort of core principles or, or two uh, capacities of, of, of the materials. And I'm looking at get that published in a technical paper um, in February uh, 21, which should give you some numbers to put into your WUFI or, or indeed any other calculating um, uh, methodology. Like Joseph, I, I share quite a lot of reservation with the Glaser method. Um, We've used it quite a lot in our um, refurbishments because I'm, I get asked a lot, did you do a condensation risk assessment? Um, and me looking at the wall and saying, yeah, that's kind of traditional and good and it's not compromised in its vapor transmission and everything's gonna be fine because I'm using the right materials for the intervention. That's not enough. So I've, I've, I've used it and, and generally it, it gives satisfactory results, but we are operating in the comfortable space. And as Joseph said, if you're going to do something a little bit different with a hybrid building then maybe some different materials that you may choose to use because some uh, <clears throat> modern insulation materials are very high performing i can't argue with that um, you will need to do some some number crunching and i'm hoping that these numbers will help you do it so here is a, a little bit of an extract on a reduced set of um, of figures what is interesting is that this old college A is a Craig Leith 
uh, sandstone. So much of Edinburgh is that. I hope you can see my mouse on the, on the line there. And Old College B, uh, we have now know, is from probably from Hales Quarry. So two kind of different sandstones are different qualities. Old College A was the ashlar work on the outside, and then the, uh, the rubble on the inside was possibly from Hales. Uh, and then our friend Gifnock from down the road, uh, which features uh, in quite a lot of Glasgow, and a bit of earth and, and two types of, of lime as well. This is the vapour permeability we discussed and the diffusion resistance. And then the second uh, category of results is the, is the thermal side with, with some moisture. So um, th this, is the, uh, this extended table of both these uh, will come out in early 21 uh, with a few extra uh, materials in there to give a bit of, a bit of scope. Um, and what we're hoping to do is to align that to reality by um, considering work at Holyrood Park Lodge, which I've described to some of you already, where we had a uh, property in care, so looked after by Hess, uh, 19th century category B listed uh, lodge house, geometrically pretty complicated, different roof planes, uh, bay windows and all sorts of sticky outy Victorian bits, which makes it a nice gingerbread thing to look at. Um, but from a thermal modeling point of view, there's quite a lot of inputs. Um, we've had five years of monitoring by uh, a monitoring team from the called Archimetrics. We've had solid U, or U values and humidity at different thicknesses. We've done quite a bit of work on the roof with um, uh, warm roof uh, work with or without some gaps, which is interesting. And then we're getting the results summarized in the refurbished case study, which is up on our website already. I've been up for, for some time now. So you can get a look at the uh, early results on that. The full monitoring results for the real uh, building physics spotters amongst you uh, will be published later, um, probably early part of next year, if I can get some, get some funds together to, to allow a, a really in-depth scrutiny of endless wiggly graphs and humidities and all sorts of interesting stuff. The building is in a fairly sheltered part of Edinburgh, so the results are modestly dull, to be honest, and dull is good in hydrothermal terms with um, humidities and, and fluctuations within the wall sitting comfortably below the, um, the, accepted, the accepted thresholds for, for hydrothermal risk, um, which to me and you is dry, uh, and that's what we want. Just to give you a feel for, the, for what I'm talking about, this is, this is the lodge itself now. Um, that, uh, that large tree is no longer with us, so the solar gain will, uh, have, has changed, and it'll be interesting if the results actually reflect that. Um, here's my uh, pet scientist uh, tapping some numbers in. Uh, you'll see some of the monitoring stuff on the top corner, uh, and this uh, wooden panel um, is not a mural cupboard, it's a way of opening up and looking at the insulation uh, and the lath and plaster and how it and interacts together. Um, I won't dwell on ventilation and, and how we address that in the building because that's an entirely different topic, but you might be amused by this um, uh, square looking mirror, which is a, a radiant heat panel, excellent for thermal comfort, very, very bad for sap points. So if you're doing a um, uh, SAP calculation and getting your SAP points for the EPC banding, uh, secondary electric heating really does get the thumbs down. Um, but just to draw to a, to a close really and to wrap things into a, a little bit of a wider context, um, our big focus now is skills development and qualifications in the retrofit sector. Um, that is starting at trade level uh, and supervisor and sort of installer type, type things. So we're not necessarily at the designer level, but we probably should be. The energy efficiency story continues, understanding the EPC and further assessment. Um, it is generally acknowledged at policy terms that the EPC is a, is a, is a fair enough starting point. Um, it was not designed as a, as a compliance tool, and now it's become one. Um, and certain categories of structures, and I would argue possibly traditional buildings pre-1919, deserve further assessment. And we're working with the Energy Savings Trust on developing a methodology for that. I'm very interested in passive measures for cooling and ventilation. 
uh, cooling because our summers are warming up and we will be talking less about cold and more about cooling and then ventilation, its close cousin, and how we achieve that. Um, a lot on lime and conditional components, uh, more standard building conservation stuff there, but if we get, if we get the lime right uh, and the lime in repair right and the lime for render right, we can reduce, uh, I would contend, uh, hydrothermal risk by maximizing uh, the vapor dispersal capacity of the buildings that we're operating in. Big on circular economy. So this is no longer, in my view, about very, very low U values and very, very high air tightnesses, which are the two metrics on which the refurbishment uh, world has been structured really for the last 20, 30 years even. And I've added this one in, uh, measures for a COVID world, because I would contend that our buildings need to operate in a slightly different fashion to what they have now. And I have uh, got to publication um, uh, in design really for um, a series of building uh, properties, building components and building functionalities that traditional and historic societies learned the hard way when they didn't have the medical uh, capacity that we had and they had to manage internal environments uh, for, for health. Um, now health does not always equal necessarily comfort, um, but these are things that I think are questions that us as in the, in the wider built environment are gonna have to ask. And I would suggest that the historic environment can actually give a few clues for some, for some measures by which we manage uh, that environment for, uh, to mitigate uh, deleterious health effects. Just to cheer you up though with a happy conservation story, this is more of a, a circular economy question. Um, here we have a total ruin in the back land, the back close of, of Dunbar. It has no roof, clearly. It has most of its walls um, missing uh, uh, intermediate floors. There are fragments of internal linings and fittings hanging on there and even a window. Um, and using uh, local materials, uh, traditional techniques, uh, pretty much like for like replacement. Um, uh, and, and myself, uh, a joiner, a, uh, a mason and a couple of laborers, um, we got a massive chimney rebuilt with traditional mortars in the winter. We got a roof done with building warrant approval uh, with local timber and a largely traditional design. And as of now, we're kind of at this stage uh, nearly finished uh, with insulated lime render on the inside and we're going to get uh, uh, wood fiber forward insulation for that uh, for the pitch on the roof that you can see and probably a foam glass um, insulated floor of some description although there's a, a little bit to go there so that's a, a cheery conservation story with some uh, some thermal benefits uh, once we've got the building in use, we can start to pick it apart in the hydrothermal uh, story and start to see how a fairly robust application of, of traditional materials um, used in, in, in exactly the way they were in the, in the 18th century, um, see how that can help us manage internal environments for health uh, and also for thermal performance and, and energy efficiency in a largely reconstructed building, but which will have lessons for refurbishment as well as I hope. Um, publications then, because I know you all love reading, we've got the informed guides below your level, really short guides for trades and professionals, technical papers, we're getting into the detail now, and I'll show you a link. I think the, 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 the refurbishment case studies where we describe in some detail what we did for each building, I think is probably where you might end. Um, NZEB is a European uh, collaborative project that we've been involved in that is uh, big on uh, case studies hosted online with a whole manner of descriptions and um, uh, enabling literature. And retrofit training at the engine shed, my spies tell me, and since I'm writing the course material, it better happen um, in spring 2021. So that's going to be based in Stirling with satellite delivery in other parts of Scotland, I hope. Short guide one, you may remember that is being going to be reissued in the in uh, in the January and the February uh, to reflect uh, new knowledge, a few more measures, and and things that we've learnt. And Joseph was very keen that I uh, 
got you to fully get how to find this stuff. So here is the landing page on our website. Uh, you need to be going to this thing here, archives and research, and then you'll get to here, and then hidden away down the bottom right, you get to publications. That's where you need to be heading, publications. And when you get to publications, you'll get to the most famous uh, section of it all, which is the refurbishment case studies. So, um, and you can filter to get the things you need. And here's a few little front covers to, uh, to whet your appetite. Uh, if your phones and things will work, um, sign up to the Task 59 newsletter, please. You'll get all sorts of interesting stuff from, from, from Scotland and, and uh, UK and, and indeed Europe and beyond. Uh, this is the NZEB thing. And then my final uh, pitch, if these uh, little codes work for your gadgets, um, that'll take you to the sign up page for the NZEB and, and a link to a few uh, case studies and things like that. So that's a bit of a canter. Um, in discussion with Alex, we agreed that we probably need a follow up to this with some real building detail because to be honest, that's really what you want. Um, so here, a bit of background and framework. I'm very happy to follow up with the association um, in due course as, as time permits. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. That's really great. And I think, you know, having access to, to the links um, and, and further material um, at the end there is really helpful for everyone wanting to build on this going forward. So I very much appreciate that. And uh, just to reiterate, if anyone's got any questions um, for Joseph or Roger, you know, during this, pop it in the chat um, or for all the speakers and, and we can either answer them in the chat or we could pick them up at the end. Um, so don't forget to kind of get involved. Um, so thanks, Roger. That's really appreciated. So on to our final speaker uh, for this evening, uh, Chris, Chris Morgan, um, who's just about to hopefully share his screen um, and take away the last session. I will do so. Right. OK. Thanks, Chris. 20 minutes. Right. Can you all see that? Yeah, that okay. looks good, Chris. Grand. OK. Um, it's just worth saying that many years ago, I actually did do the WIFI course. I, I, I spent I think it was about a week learning Wiffy in Glasgow. Um, but I don't pretend to be an expert like Joseph, um, but it was very good at, um, I suppose what I took away from it is an intuitive sense of when I need to worry or not, which is rather what Joseph was saying actually. Um, some things I just sort of know are going to be okay, but others you can tell are going to be issues. So this, uh, my job tonight is just to rattle through a case study to give you a bit of a feel of how, um, it's an illustration of Woofy as part of the design process that, that we might do. Uh, so I'll just crack on. Okay, this is the building that we're looking at. It is a solid stone built tenement in Glasgow. Um, it's unrepresentative in some ways and in other ways it's very representative. So there are eight one bedroom flats in there. They are all owned by Southside Housing Association. It's just outside Govan Hill and they are all empty. It's a slightly coincidental thing. One of the irritations of Enefit is uh, that you can only get benefit, um, which is to say, sorry, passive house for older buildings, passive house for existing buildings, which was the idea here. Um, you can only get that for a whole building block, which uh, is, is going to be an issue in Scotland because that very rarely occurs. So one of the reasons this became, in, it became uh, a possibility was because they owned the whole place and it was empty. So there was an opportunity to do benefit which you wouldn't normally get. You can't get any certification for your flat. You can only get it for the block. And that's, um, it's, it's going to be a problem. Anyway, we were, we offered three options for refurbishment and uh, long story short, we ended up going for benefit primarily because we applied for and won funding for what amounts to an exemplar for Glasgow for the COP26 um, gathering. Um, uh, Edinburgh won money for a new build, sort of MMC thing, and we won funding for uh, refurbishment. We thought that that money would go to the project, and it turns out it doesn't, none of it goes to the project. It's all for monitoring and dissemination and education. So we do have a spectacular monitoring budget, though, which is good. Uh, that was the front of the building, sorry, I should say, which we believe is Locker Briggs, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, uh, and the back of the building is a sort of blonde sandstone, and I don't know the, the type. Uh, the project's funded by Southside and Glasgow City Council significantly. Uh, CCG are the contractors on board as a sort of partnership with the client and it's a traditional contract. So we're the ones calling the shots. 
it's a complete overhaul um, internally, uh, full strip out because there's a lot of damage. It was been derelict for quite a while in, in, in some flats, some urgent long-term maintenance. Um, as I say, in Enefit, energy performance was agreed, um, but we were able to convince everybody involved that we should also be taking account of air quality, uh, the use of natural materials, embodied carbon, and a more holistic approach to fabric, not just slapping on whatever had the, US, uh, the, the best U value. And everybody sort of was okay with that on the whole. Um, a quick couple of slides just to show you what the building's like. That's the building there in the square. What you can see is that it's heavily overshadowed. It's an atrocious building for trying to achieve benefit or passive house because there's basically no sunshine. In a normal passive house, about a third of your heat is from the sun, a third is from internal gains, and a third is from the residual heat that you have to generate. And there is absolutely there's very, very little solar gain in this building. So that then puts a lot of pressure on um, trying to find the, either the internal gains, which you don't really want to abuse. Um, and then you've got to find that all from your, from your heating system. So that's been a problem. And what hasn't been overshadowed by buildings is overshadowed by trees. Um, and so we were up against it really, and it, and it has made the project more difficult. Um, we have very small Southeast facing windows, which look straight into trees. Um, and we have large amounts of northwest facing windows, which is terrific because they lose all the heat. Uh, and we have significant unavoidable thermal bridging because it's a stone building. There's a view from the south. Uh, so you can see it uh, pictured there, a view from the east, uh, due east there. So you get a bit of a sense of what's going on. And from the west, the street frontage again. I hope that makes sense, all of that. Um, there were quite a few structural issues. Uh, you might be able to see in the middle of the screen there a piece of a stone uh, sort of column which is all being built onto, onto timber which is subsequently rotted and so things are starting to fall apart. Um, there, there, we had to spend quite a bit of money on making sure it didn't fall down basically. Um, and we commissioned a second rot report because the first rot report uh, suggested that we cut out all the rotten timber and then spent 20 grand on chemicals to make the whole building highly toxic. But anything that lived or breathed would, would, would soon be gone. Um, we've redone that and the guy pointing meaninglessly at the ceiling um, is an expert in what I call building pathology. And with him, we went through and we have a sort of undertaking that no chemicals will be used. So this was part of our commitment to avoid chemicals and to safeguard the air quality and, and, and the health of people living in the building. So it's all perfectly fine. Uh, this is, um, can I, uh, you may not be able to see all the, the, the words there, but um, essentially this is it. So this is looking from the back of the building and there's, this is the stuff we're going to do in very basic terms. So we're insulating the loft as you'd expect. There's a fair bit of rot in the rafters. So we're needing to take the, slate, uh, the tiles off at the bottom of the roof and uh, faff about there, make sure the insulation meets up and check for decay. Um, there are issues with increasing the windows to try and get some more sunlight into that back uh, part of the building. Uh, triple glazing, uh, as you would expect with Enifit, um, external wall insulation on the back of the building, which has been extraordinarily contentious, which I didn't anticipate. Um, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, which you have to do for Enifit, and um, significantly wastewater heat recovery because uh, it's difficult to pass passive house with this project. It doesn't lend itself. And so one of the things we're doing is doing as much heat recovery from both air and water as we possibly can. Um, internal wall insulation on the front of the building, on the street side that you can see number eight there, uh, which is the main bit of the chat, and then other measures to essentially make the building both energy efficient and hopefully robust in the long term. Uh, why in effect? Because a lot of the problems that we've created for ourselves are because we're trying to get to this standard. And, and it's because we have a climate emergency and yes, we want to look after buildings and yes, we want the moisture to be managed, but we also want to have very, very low energy buildings. Um, so we will be able to reduce the carbon emissions in this building by 90%, roughly. Uh, and we will have fuel bills down at roughly £10 a month, most of which is to do with heating hot water, hence the wastewater heat recovery whilst maintaining excellent comfort. So that's why we're doing it for, well, for those reasons. Okay, so this is the basic drawings, uh, but it's probably easier just to go with basic drawings. So the drawing on the left is the, the rear wall, the rear and gable wall, which is the solid stone with um, lining internally and external wall insulation of some description on the outside. And what you can see is that the air tightness layer in this building is the lime plaster. So that layer, oh, I can point, can't I? Hang on. 
Oh no, I can't, I don't know the pointer, it's funny. Uh, on the inside of the stone wall, you can see little red dots. That is our air tightness layer and that is a line plaster. So we're not achieving it with membranes, we're achieving it with plaster. Um, and uh, so that's the external wall insulation on the back and the side of the building and on the front of the building where we all agreed that it wouldn't make sense to externally insulate, we have internal wall insulation. Again, a lime plaster, uh, a particularly hygro, hygro uh, moisture permeable lime plaster on the inside face, followed by a wood fiber board and uh, another lime, lime plaster on the inside of that. That might change because of services. Um, our, at the moment, the, the idea is that there will be 120 of wood fiber on the inside of that wall and 200 of mineral wool on the outside. But we are still faffing about with the PHPP and various changes that the planners and um, building control have required. So we're still messing about with that. We did therm calculations for all the thermal bridging. So it's all been uh, sort of properly assessed and addressed. So we know what all our side values are and we know that we're okay. We've had to drop insulation down in various places, but it's not terribly complicated. Um, we initially assumed that at the base of the wall on the street side, because the street is actually level with the floor, we um, took the joists out of wall. We're going to take the joists out of the wall and build a little wall there. You can see a new block wall uh, and we'll cantilever the joists off that so that we know we're not going to have problems with moisture there. Again, that was an intuitive thing. We didn't do a woofy cat. We just knew it was a problem or we knew it was a risk. And so I just took the view that we'll do that anyway. Uh, and I would say that's not woofy that helped us make that decision, but it was doing the woofy course that made me clear that certain places are more risky than others and it would be sensible just to not go there. Uh, we then, what did I, there was something about that. Oh, yeah, but we left the floor joist in the wall on the street side above that uh, pending woofy analysis because I was nervous about it. Um, and sure enough, we got our woofy report done. We got samples of both stone types done. Uh, they were taken away and uh, tested. We got various wall types modeled and we paid for a number of iterations so that we could try to get to a point where we were comfortable both with the benefit and with the moisture risk. Uh, the blue and orange lines are the uh, the red stone, which I'm pretty sure is Locker Briggs, but I don't actually know for certain. Um, and because the testing was done in London, nobody had heard of Locker Briggs, so they just said red sandstone. And I need to chase that up at some point. Um, and what you can see from that is that the red sandstone, which is the one on the wall where we have most problems or potential problems, is the one which is most absorptive. And that's a pain. Um, and the yellow and grey are the blonde sandstone, which is well protected and I'm not worried about, but that's good stone <laughs> anyway, so it's exactly the wrong way around and slightly irritating. Um, so what we have learned, we've modelled all of the rear and gable walls, various combinations, and what we can see is that really regardless of the number of stress tests we do, that regardless of the orientations or the thicknesses of insulation or the type of render, we've, we've, we've modelled in different sorts of render finish, different sorts of, I mean, all sorts of things. Uh, essentially, regardless of what we do, it's okay. It basically stays, so the graph on the right shows a number of iterations, and there's several of these graphs, and essentially it's way below the red line, more or less whatever we try to do to it. Um, and so I am not worried at all about the EWI. And uh, one of the key things was that the moisture content in the wall will stay below uh, the level at which there would be a risk to the joists in the wall, and, and, and we're nowhere near a problem there. So unless anything goes catastrophically wrong with the EWI, I think we're fine. <laughs> It's not the same on the street side. Um, the street side is north facing. Uh, it gets a lot of rain because it's Scotland and it's facing north. Um, because it's particularly porous, I think the risks are quite high. We have put quite a lot of care and attention into the way that we detail the front of that stone wall. So we are repointing everything and we're repairing the stone where we need to. The stone's actually in quite good nick, but the pointing isn't. So that's all being handled with some care. Uh, so we're confident that the, build, the wall will dry to the outside um, through the normal channels, as it were, but we do know now that we are compromising the ability of that wall to dry to the inside, which is why it is critical that that insulation is breathable, moisture transfusive. So the wood fibre and the lime are not sort of eco choices. They're all about protecting that wall. Uh, and I think somebody somewhere, was it um, Joseph was talking about this thing of if you have this problem, you have to put a vapour barrier in. And he said that's categorically wrong. And, and, and this is a perfect example of that. If you put a vapor barrier anywhere on the inside of that wall, you would risk 
the moisture in the wall building up to a point where it was, well, it's a big problem. Um, the internal wall insulation means the stonework is cold though, so I have some concerns about uh, what the effect of that will be when it's saturated and cold. Uh, we must make that insulation trans moisture transfusive. Um, and what we can see from the various stress tests that we did is that the, um, the, moisture in, the moisture levels in the wall increase the further out the wall you go. So uh, at the lime plaster, it's not too bad, but it gets wetter and wetter the further you go towards the outside, which means that anything in that wall, i.e. timber, is at increased risk the further to the right it goes, if you know what I mean. The one good thing we have is that because it's passive house, because it's NFIT, we know that MVHR systems, ventilation systems tend, which is not always a good thing, but they tend to dry out the internal air. They certainly don't get, uh, they tend towards dryness. And so I'm actually quite confident that uh, there will be a constant drying out to the inside of the building. Ventilation is a, is a relevant factor in all of this. Um, what am I saying here? Wood fibre remains, so we tested this, the wood fibre will remain safe from decay. We know that for certain because we tested it a lot, so I'm not worried about that. I'm also not worried about mould risk on the internal surfaces. We know that the temperatures will be high enough and the moisture, the relative humidity will be, high, will be good enough. Um, the timber, yes, sorry, I've already said this, the timber within the wall is at risk. That's what we established. Uh, so we modelled it with a reduced thickness of internal wall insulation to see at what point we might get away with it. And we also modelled, not that I asked for this, I should say, but uh, the, um, the modellers modelled it with a storm dry treatment, which I despise, but they did. And because they, we asked them to try and find a solution. This graph bears some uh, time. What, what am I for time? Uh, about five minutes left, so I should be okay. Um, this graph um, is just worth a little bit, ignore the bit at the bottom. Essentially, the three wiggly lines at the top are the three different thicknesses of internal wall insulation that we, that we modeled, or they modeled. Um, and what you can see is that the, 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 the less insulation you put on, the closer it gets to the 85% uh, relative humidity, which is what we need for safety. So. Uh, the stone wall as it stands with whatever amount of insulation we put on is above that line so it's at risk. The way they tried to help us get around this is to say, oh well if you slap storm dry over the outside of the stone, that stone wall will say drier and will get us under the line. So their report said if you put storm dry on the outside of the wall and you, I hope everybody knows what storm dry is, these sort of hydrophobic treatments, sort of creams, um, we can talk about that afterwards if people don't know, but in theory a very good thing and in practice almost certainly not in my view. Um, but the point is that they got us under the line with 60 mil of IWI and um, storm dry treatment, which would be fine for, uh, in theory, but uh, 60 mil IWI actually isn't going to get us through the passive house certification. So we've got a, we've got a tension there. And I, I haven't really said this in a very professional sense, but I don't trust storm dry treatments and I don't want to use them. I've been through this conversation uh, dozens of times over probably 20 years, and I, I, I'm pretty certain it's not going to work out well. So I don't want to start there. Uh, Toby Cambry, who was the chap at Green Gage who did the study or oversaw the study, is just starting a PhD on storm dry for SPAB. Um, so that will be an interesting process to watch because um, he's a good guy. Uh, we have agreed with the certifiers that because of the risk, they will agree to a lower thickness of internal wall insulation, but we can't take the mickey. We have to find some sort of reasonable compromise. And the factor of safety we have is that the ventilation is, is drying out the space. I hope that will make sense. We have, as a result, ripped all of the, so we, we, we have proposed that all of the joists come out of the wall and we have revised that drawing with the engineer so that uh, all the joists stop, uh, basically before you get to the wall. What we're trying to do though, um, is get Archimetrics, who you've already seen uh, at, at Rogers Place at, at Holyrood Cot uh, Lodge, to continue to monitor. We're gonna leave the joists in the wall and monitor them in real time, because what I'm interested in is if Woofy is right uh, that those uh, timber joist ends decay, or, and it might be wrong, in which case it'd be very interesting to find out because it's quite a big deal if all the uh, floor joists rot in Glasgow when you internally insulate a building. Um, it's not replicable because, well, in many cases, because you can't take the joists out of a wall if you only own one flat. So your neighbors above and below may have a view on that. So our conclusions uh, are that the red sandstone is much more porous. Um, and this is a big issue because if, if 
a large chunk of Glasgow is built with it and people are going to be internally insulating their buildings, then there is, in my view, quite a high risk of significant damage to stone walls and the embedded timber within those walls. And I don't think anybody's really thinking too hard about that. Um, and, and removing the joists in the way that we're doing is simply not going to be an option for the majority of people. So it's an interesting question. What I would, though, say is that as part of this sort of problem, Woofie and or, or Delphin or, or others are a useful design uh, tool to, to enable us to assess risk. And um, I think it's just about true to say that any of it is compatible with moisture management, but we do need quite a lot of care and effort. And this would have only been this is only possible because we got this additional funding for monitoring. So I hope that was useful. And Christine, Christina hasn't, uh, yes, you've only just now arrived, so I'm not in trouble, that's good. You were completely on time, so thank you, Chris, that was perfect. And I think really interesting to kind of end on a, a, a you know, that those series of talks on a case study um, and the actual practical application, uh, which is great. We've had a few questions um, come in from people on the chat. So if Joseph and Roger want to rejoin us with their, their cameras on, um, you can see all four of us as a treat for the evening and um, we can uh, do some Q&A. Uh, Chris, there's one for you uh, here actually, which is um, just, just to kind of to kick us off, um, following up on the wood fibre insulation in the case study, um, it was noted that it was tested against decay, but uh, do you know what the life expectancy of it is, you know, does, in terms of longevity? Um, I, I don't specifically know the answer to that, but if it is, if it is shown under Woofy that it is not going to decay over time because it will not get a buildup of moisture, mm -hmm. and I know that it's breathable and I know that the lime plaster inside that is breathable, and I know that the ventilation system tends towards drying it out, then I would say that there is no risk that the lifespan is essentially as long as nothing goes horribly wrong. Having said that, things do sometimes go horribly wrong, so there's a the thing. Um, but under the woofy modeling, it, it would carry on being not at risk. Yeah, I think Roger had his hand up there, and then Joseph, so both, both want to jump in. Yeah, just, <laughs> I mean, if the conditions are all right, it'll 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 stay there for, you know, for an awfully long time, and I think that, that applies to an awful lot of building fabric. That's helpful, Joseph. Yeah, um, I, I, I would agree. Uh, I would also say that I remember installing uh, wood fiber external wall insulation in a, I think it was a 1970s house in um, a village called, a, a seaside village called Hoth in near Dublin. And um, I thought it was a reasonably sheltered location. It's, it was near the harbor, but it, you know, far enough away and other buildings and trees and other things. Um, however, there was a particular, um, the, the, the junction of the eaves and the window, uh, sorry, not the eaves, excuse me, the window reveal and the uh, rear patio door, um, somehow the, the wind coming down the garden, which was hilly, uh, introduced, I don't know, a pathway, whatever. Mm -hmm. There was basically water concentration, concentrating that was being brought by the profile of the window sill or the patio door sill into a concentrated point in the wood fiber. And because the wood fiber, the outer portion of this particular system was treated, but the, the wood fiber behind that was not treated um, on the basis that normally the weather hits the outside, but in this case with the window reveal, this concentration of water, liquid water reaching this point, it, it exceeded the capacity of that wood fiber to, to, to deal with it. So I suppose the point is there is a vulnerability to um, plant-based materials when we use them well, and we're very, very focused on the connective those connective bits that I mentioned earlier on um, and, and the as-built in-service conditions, um, then it could be fine. So what, what, what Chris was referring to there and, and Roger as well is the, that overall hydrothermally, looking at the plain element, the assemblies, um, there was the, the breathability, the characteristics, how, how it water, um, how, it, how it got wet, how it dried out and how these cycles repeated. Um, if this is done well, this can happen for very, very, very many years. But where a particular junction occurs and you haven't addressed the potential of a seal to fail and external wall insulation seals are typically badly applied to windows and doors um, and, and people ask them to do things that they shouldn't do and the, the old thumb running down the side to create some sort of little triangular seal has no relationship to how the uh, designer of the sealant uh, wants you to use that sealant, but we do this all the time. We don't talk about it. A seal should work between two surfaces where there's equal movement and an equal uh, depth of material across it. Not, not in this condition 
where there's a little triangle which is pulling in all sorts of ways and heat and moisture are having impacts and effects and it's even pulling off a surface like a PVC window, let's say, or, or gloss painted material, which is a material designed not to take a fixing. So, you, you mm -hmm. know, not to take adherence. So we have to be aware of those things. Once we are, then then it's, it's fine. But it's, you know, the, the devil is in the detail. I think that's really interesting because it, it cuts across quite a few things that we've talked about in terms of risk as well because when you look at a wall buildup and you're looking at that pure cross section as Chris highlighted and Roger did as well essentially you're looking at that perfect condition whereas it's where it meets the floor it's where it meets the window it's a reduction in stone thickness and it's looking at things um, you know with a bit of a wider lens as opposed to just in those small cross sections which I think you know has to be part of that risk analysis um, especially you know picking up on quite a few points from this evening um, Chris, do you want to jump in? Well, just one of the one a good example of where I think we're at much higher risk is on that north facade, which as Roger said at one point was mostly window anyway. The thing about windows is that rain runs straight off them onto a sill. And so that stone is at excessive risk compared to other bits of stone which were just underneath the lip of that sill. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, the bit of stone underneath the sill, I suspect will be fine, but that sill itself, um, if it's not in absolutely con perfect condition, will there are a number of ways in which moisture can find its way into the building through that sill because of the high loading off the window. So there are places like that where we're putting a bit of extra time and thought into it. Um, and for what it's worth, I would say that all of the suppliers, manufacturers and uh, people that have been supplying this information to us have been unhelpful in understanding the risks. So we have um, people just don't know, you know, they're selling this stuff to you and then you're saying, well, what's the what's the effect of this? Well, you'll have to get a calculation done on, but do you not have that calculation? Do you not sell that? Oh, no, no, no. And it's just interesting that we've had to do a huge amount of our own work, which in this case was lucky because we had the money to do it. Well, yeah, and we're benefiting from it, Chris. So, so thank you that uh, sharing that is appreciated. Well, the industry I, isn't up to it. That's what that yeah, is. I think that's the point. difficulty when all the products, you know, when you just can't get that bigger picture um, through the supply chain is, an, is another issue. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, just we, we, we need to be aware that we're asking people who's, whose primary focus is on selling material. It doesn't mean they're not ethical um, or, or, or not intelligent or decent people, but their primary focus is on selling material. And we're asking them in some sense to support a design specification exercise. And, and they would at some level say either that's somewhere around the government, government guidance and our, our, our trade association kind of guidance or your guidance, you're the specifier. So, you know, we do have to be aware that the problem at the moment is we, we haven't been supported for decades by government bodies providing decent guidance. And we're trying to pick up quite quickly um, where the materials have changed, uh, you know, the, it, so many more additional materials available. The standards we're looking for are radically changing very, very quickly within our, our lifetimes, within everyone in this room, this virtual room, standards have possibly doubled in the time that we've been in practice. That's extraordinary, that's unprecedented. So, you know, we need support in that. And, and I think, I don't know how we do it, but we should lobby governments more. And we should also commission research more. And, and again, go back to Roger, I think they, Star Scotland stand out in these two islands as being a body that have spent small chunks of money to do get really, really high quality research done that then links together and builds a picture over time. And then that linkaging back, like I said earlier on, with the new BS5250 coming out is going to be very important. That, you know, uh, there is better and better guidance that's, that's, that's supporting each other. You know, we had a problem eight, 10 years ago, even five, six years ago, where there was really good people doing things and there was guidance right beside them that did not support what they were doing and guidance that was contrary. And, and people saying, we'll give you grant aid, but not if you do it like this. But you're saying, but this is the way we need to do it. And, and this was really problematic. We are now moving to a position where uh, you know, applied building physics is being understood better and the guidance is more coherent and is more appropriate and sensitive to historic buildings. And that's, a, that's great. No, it's a great place to be. And it, yeah, it's nice to know, um, obviously, that uh, Scottish Government and, and their support as well has been a little bit of a step ahead and hopefully we can stay there, which is great. Um, and just to pick up on a few of the other questions and, and kind of chat uh, streams coming through. Um, so Kieran Gaffney noted that, you know, looking at some of the uh, Historic Environment Scotland case studies, um, when you're adding such little insulation to buildings, you know, ha are they meeting building regulations? You know, are they striving to be carbon neutral? Um, and could we talk around that? And I know that a little bit of the chat 
uh, developed to say that the lodge actually did achieve EPC ban C and is building regulation compliant. And I just wondered if from a case study perspective, Roger, you could talk a little bit more about that in terms of the growing targets for building regulations sure. and carbon um, neutral. I mean, I think I think quite a lot of our work is is predicated on what will the building take um, in a sort of reasonably not cost effective, but 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 without you know without intervening massively because we're coming from a building conservation standpoint, not necessarily a complete energy one, um, and I think carbon neutral would be would be very difficult. Um, renewables will will contribute quite a bit to that deficit though. And I think if the wider consideration of, of embodied carbon and lifetime of structures is considered, then you, you, you know, it, it, if you look at the carbon utilization across the whole piece, that, that might start to make it a bit easier. Um, it, with respect to the building regulation side, um, the, the measures in, uh, in, in the, the short guide have been reviewed by Building Standards Division and they're, they're, they're okay with it. Um, and the, the new guide that's coming out has been developed with Building Standards Division at Livingston as well. Um, but it, I think there probably is a qualifier that in retrofit or in certain types of retrofit, we, we do use the word compliance where practicable. Um, and, and I fully accept that, that we would struggle to meet every, every modern standard for a new build but we're, we're not, I'm not pretending to be in that space. Um, and I think that the cost, the, the, the cost of some interventions will start to make it um, very difficult for, for private clients, certainly, to, to, to cover the, the, the amount of work needed. So there is a, there is a balance in all of this. Um, I'm naturally leading to the sort of softer edge of things because that's, that's kind of what I do. Chris, do you want to jump in? Well, it was to support Roger in that. Well, it was to say something about that, that I've done a lot of work over the years on energy modelling, energy efficiency modelling. And one of the things that I'm quite clear about, but I have very little backup on this, but just treat this as my opinion, <laughs> is that if you do a sort of SAP analysis, if you, if, if you imagine buildings in the way that SAP imagines them, essentially the sort of, there's, a, there's a, a source of radiant heat in the middle of the building and it just sort of, it radiates outwards towards, so, so you, you, the, you, you look at the, the the surface area of the building times the U value is the, is, is the natural way then to imagine how heat is lost. So walls, because there's four of them, if you imagine a, you know, there's four walls and only two bits of roof and one bit of floor, the walls are a big deal. When you really study carefully what's happening with heat in buildings and how energy is being lost, it's, it's got much more to do with air tightness and um, stack effect. So when you model buildings in PHPP, for example, you get a completely different set of answers often to what when you model them in SAP. And so one of the things I've come to the view of is that the things that really matter when you're making older buildings energy efficient are floors and ceilings, or floors and roofs, or whatever, and windows and air tightness, but not the walls. Now, the, so the walls, in my view, are the least important thing, unless there's some particular reason why they're obviously the biggest deal. I mean, sometimes they are, you know, but usually they're not. And the other thing about walls, so they're, they're the least important thing to insulate, but they're also the place where you have the most problems. And it has the most problems with planning, with hydrothermal analysis and all sorts of other things. And it's also quite costly. So if it wasn't for the fact that we were trying to get this benefit thing, I would have just cut right back on the wall insulation because I don't think wall insulation is that important, actually. I think all the other things are the windows, the air tightness and so on. But um, I'm not able to operate like that unless I'm doing retrofit for people, for private clients, uh, because otherwise you have to, you have to, you know, you have to get building warrant or you have to get THPP or whatever it is. So I'm just saying that because I think it's very useful to know that. Oh, that's helpful. Joseph, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just as a, as a segue to what Chris was saying there, I, I put something into the chat earlier on about a, a pro little project of my own that it's, you know, I'm the owner of, which we're going to be moving on uh, quite soon. Um, in, in my busy schedule is something that, that uh, the family wants done. <laughs> uh, and, and we looked at the surface um, loss areas of the building and the walls were the least significant areas um, where, again, I, I think I would qualify somewhat what Chris said and just that 
I think there's a point where you're getting radiant balance and that's important mm -hmm. that, you know, your body, you, the floor sees very small amount of your body, uh, same for the ceiling, uh, but you're okay. Your head, you lose a lot of heat because there's so much blood. There's so much uh, energy being generated or used in your head, in your brain, but your, your, the, the surface of your body can radiate quite a lot to the surface of the wall and the windows. So there is a point where some level of radiant balance is necessary. And obviously the importance of removing the risk of surface condensation is, is, is very necessary. But for some buildings where the floor, where the wall um, is a relatively small area of the, the heat loss um, surfaces, heat, uh, you know, you, you can actually do with a lot, lot less insulation than you want, uh, th th sorry, than you might have thought, and still achieve a very high quality, very comfortable, very healthy, um, super insulated uh, building. So we, for instance, the, the, uh, an early example of concrete from 1886, it's a single story mid-terrace uh, cottage, uh, urban cottage that we're looking at in Dublin. And we're using uh, diathonite to achieve 0.6. It's a slurry, cork lime slurry to achieve 0.6 of a U value on the walls. But because of the depth of the original suspended timber floor of about 600 millimeters, we're able to use foamed glass aggregate for the full depth of the limecrete slab on top. There's no radon barrier because the radon that we measured on site is extremely low. Uh, but we're also going to put in a VMPHR system, which is slightly pressurized, a compact unit, which is a cylinder, hot water cylinder, the uh, exhaust air heat pump and, and the MVHR all in one unit, all controlled, um, and a super insulated ceiling with cellulose for the cooms and, and, and above, and a very high level of air tightness. So we have an extremely breathable condition where the insulated values of the walls are the poorest conditions, but everything else together working is creating a very comfortable and very high performing uh, building, which is still very appropriate in terms of moisture. No, that's that's really Roger. Do you want to jump in, and I'll, I'll go yeah, to just quick, just quickly. I, I, yeah, I kind of agree with the walls, but I think I think there are opportunities for walls, and certainly gable ends and rear elevations. EWI is probably the way ahead with the right configuration. Yeah. And um, you know, once we get over the sort of rubble mania, uh, which is pretty rubbish at keeping the water out anyway, and and failing and getting worse, f fine. Um, and I think I think I think a balance, but walls I think are, have been pushed. To a perhaps a higher profile of in, of intervention than, than than maybe they they really deserve in terms of maintaining he, thermal yeah. human yeah. human comfort, um, which uh, which is a different one. I mean, this leads me on to a question um, from from Alex, which is, you know, do we do we know about the long term effects of the introduction of insulation on stone walls? Um, I suppose in terms of of duration and over time, uh, are any of you aware of any studies that have been done? Well, the the, the the, the argument sort of suggests that internal wall insulation will quite naturally result in a lower temperature on the outside face and therefore is it more prone to to spalling and frosting and, and, and other things um, which I think is must have always been a feature of of stone walls of various thicknesses over over many many years because people have lived in different types of buildings with different thicknesses um, I think possibly I think that is a, a a modelled scenario, but I can't say I've actually seen it. Uh, and when stone spalls off a building, is it happening because of that, or is it happening because the stone wasn't very good, um, a poor, poorer quality stone in a very specific climate? So I think the number of variables. My my gut feeling is is probably not. No, oh, that's it's, it's really interesting. And I think, you know, in terms of what we know, there's a few questions coming in for, around, you know, timber joist ends within stone walls that have um, internal insulation. You know, do we know enough about it? How different stone types affect uh, the amount of insulation that can be um, introduced? Do we know enough about it? And how different internal wall finishes affect the performance of the wall? And you, everyone's touched on these in, in slightly different ways, Chris, yourself in your presentation as well, in terms of looking at those details. And I think the question of do we know enough about, you know, is the answer no? And you know, but there are the right tools, there are the right places to look. Um, and is it an educational, you know, issue across the across the whole profession, or actually is this do we? Do we just not know yet? I, 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 I think part of it is where we're just not that confident with, with mass walls because architecture has not taught it. It's not been part of the main script for a while. And, and we have done building maintenance, even though it's nearly 50% of construction activity in Scotland, 
um, on, a, on a sort of learn as you go, which is, which is fine. Um, and I think perhaps if we do more of it, um, we'll, we'll get more, more comfortable with it. Um, and that's where some of this modeling comes in. Once we've got the right inputs, yeah. um, we can start looking at where the risk lies and then focusing on that. Sorry, Joe, I'll let you get on. No, no, you're fine, you're fine. Um, I've done some modeling using Wolfy 2D, which is, I have to say, it's a harder package to use than Wolfy Pro. Pro. I think Wolfy Pro is actually at this stage quite user-friendly, but it does require an education to use it. Um, but Wolfy 2D is, 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 a bit, is a bit harder. But it allows me to look at two-dimensional junctions such as joist ends. And I think the conclusion I came to a while ago, I didn't write a paper on it, I should have, was that um, actually slightly less, in, if, if you're in an internal insulation system, obviously, again, like Roger said, external insulation from a hydrothermal perspective, um, you know, when you're looking at the plane element as opposed to any issues that might occur at the connect where connections will get made, but the plane element where you're drying the wall, you're warming up the wall, you're reducing the potential for movement. Um, external insulation can be very sophisticated and allow things to dry out. Uh, yes, there are issues to do with streetscape or planning or whatever else that need to be looked at, uh, and then craft care and, and appropriateness. So there's lots of questions there, but from a hydrothermal perspective, it's 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 super. But but sometimes you have to do internal insulation, like my little cottage, which faced directly onto a footpath. So I, the, the the space outside my wall is not mine. Um, it's it's the airspace that's owned by the local authority. Um, but uh, the, those joist end conditions, I I found that when you actually slim down the insulation slightly at those locations, it actually helped uh, because you almost want a little bit of warmth reaching those joists. So, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with that dew point. You're dealing with a few different conditions. Some of those are unknown because that wall, that timber is buried in the wall. But, um, it, you know, it seems a certain, a certain slimming of the insulation there actually a allowed a condition which was more beneficial in that intermediate floor zone. And obviously the thing about simulation that's great is it allows you to play with lots of parameters. It allows you to play with lots of futures and lots of pasts. It allows you to play with imperfection and so on. So you can play those games and, and, and get that robustness that then influences your judgment as it's influenced Chris's. Um, Roger has, 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 is influenced by simulation work, but he's also been able to commission so much con renovation work that that's the physical work and then over time measuring it has also helped, helped him. Uh, here's a good book that might be of interest to some people, if I can do that. Um, it's called Energy Efficiency Solutions for Historic Buildings, a Handbook, and it's uh, edited by the wonderful Ale Alexandra Troy, so T-R-O-I, Alexandra Troy, and Zeno Bastian. Um, so she is in the EURAC, uh, EURAC research body, and he's in, Zeno Bastian is in the Passive House Institute, and it was part of the three, it was one of the outcomes of the European funded research project, Three and Cult, so the number three and then E-N-C-U-L-T. And they, they did a whole study on joist ends. Um, so, you know, amongst, amongst many other things, a, 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 you know, a, a really good example of, of research that, that supports and is out there. So, you know, where we don't all have the answers at this table, be aware there, there is plenty of research has been done. Um, you always, sometimes you have to contextualize it, uh, but there's lots of work done out there. I think, again, the devil is in the detail and something that you picked up there is that there's lots of ways to, to model and test and look at. And I think that, you know, that's something that, that architects are, are sometimes, you know, don't have access to or, or scared of or don't know how to use. And it's it's getting access to that expertise and knowing, you know, the steps that one can take or, or need to take in these instances. Yeah, I think that, yeah. you know, having access to that and just opening our eyes to, to that here today yeah. is re really, really helpful. Um, Chris, there are, Chris, Christine, if I could just say on that one very quickly, we need to get over this fear of opening documents. We need to get over this fear of opening uh, standards and codes of practices and even the odd research paper. We really need to get over that. We're, so many of us are, are so much coming from this design perspective, which is wonderful, and this desire to be creative and culturally significant and, and you know, the joy and the heart and the, com and the ambition and the compassion and all these lovely things that we bring as architects to the built environment, which can be lacking in other aspects of the, the built environment. But we seem to have an extraordinary reluctance to do a calculation and particularly to read the findings of other people who did those calculations or under, have written those documents. There's so much there that we're not reading as a profession and it really isn't good enough anymore. Mm. I mean, um, Roger, do you want to jump in? Yeah, there was a question earlier about building regulations and building standards and, and, in, and what I'm calling indicative solutions or generic solutions. And certainly we would like to think um, in, in ordinary everyday circumstances, we can produce a range of, of interventions that are appropriate for 
general Scottish uh, mass wall buildings, um, and that these would somehow feature in the technical handbooks. So that the building control officer, who who is of, often the one where where the architect's solution uh, and various recommendations from whoever sort of start to have a bit of a battle. And, um, and I'm afraid that quite a lot of standardized building regulation view is a sort of 1970s plasterboard plastic sheet hell, um, which I know is actively deleterious to buildings. It's not even neutral. It's not even, well, it's all right, but it won't, you know. No, it's the opposite. So, so it's curious. So I've, I mean, I've got some work to do there. Um, and that is, that is a whole lot of engagement. Um, so, but anyway, I've, one step at a time. I think it links, it might, this might have been the question you were picking up on Roger, but there, there's a, you know, how can we get building control to take um, an intelligent approach to retrofit? You know, I suppose, like you say, is it a part of lobbying? Is it just saying the same messages, getting good examples out there? Um, you know, is, is that the best way forward? Or do, do you feel it's happening a little bit in terms of, you know, past 2035 or other, other mechanisms? I, I think it needs a, a policy approach from from Rias, for example. It needs a policy approach from Noted. me and my lot. It needs, you know, it needs a sort of joined up engagement and not saying, oh, you know, you're all wrong, but saying, look, there are many, many tools here to achieve compliance uh, and the different circumstances uh, that your designers are putting in front of you will mean you, you need to hear them because it'll it'll make things happen, get things through quicker, get get retrofit happening quicker because these perceived barriers to, to upgrade can be smoothed out. I think we'll definitely pick up on that. And um, I think it's a, it's a really key point. Um, just maybe for the last question um, from, from Matthew, uh, can you see a point where the Heriot Watt paper and a, new, and a new standard could lead to a pattern book of solutions or is the situation always needing full assessment? And this is really, you know, w w there's, right. a, there's always just, a query uh, yeah. around robust details. No, that's fine. Sorry, robust do. details is the word I've been looking for. The Heriot Watt paper will be just be a lot of numbers that, that, that folk can hammer into into Woofy or, or any other. So that, that's what the Harriet was saying. That, that, that is not a magic wand for, for, for robust details. But I'd like to think that the the the, the retrofit publication that, that we're doing, which is a follow on to our 2014 one. So, you know, we've had stuff published for a while, perhaps allows designers a little bit more of of, of robust de of, of a pattern book for robust detailing yes and I think if we didn't achieve that we would have got we would have not done the right thing because you can't spend you you have to you have to reach for easily accessible uh, and uh, things for, for most buildings now there will always be building specific yeah of course and, and different things different circumstances but a lot of the time you need to have the confidence that yeah we can do this and it generally works and my general contention is if you have the right palette of materials, those condensation risk events, which will happen in, in, in various conditions, they are dispersed by the nature of the materials you're using. Capillary active materials are massively forgiving. You've got to work pretty hard to saturate a wall. You really have to work hard, um, but it seems to happen because people are stepping uh, away in, material in materials and physical detailing uh, and then standard defects, which, which build up to. Okay, but I think that's that's really helpful. I think I've missed loads of questions, and I think I went on my own tangent with my own um, questions. So apologies for that. Taking advantage of the expertise in the situation, but there's a huge amount of thanks coming through on the chat, and I think you know presentations were enjoyed by by everyone. Um, and I just want to say you know thank you uh, to, to all of you for taking the time to to speak to us tonight. I realise that you know it's an important area of building knowledge essentially, but this is really a snapshot and an introduction into and we. We could probably have a whole lecture series on, on this subject. So I think it's something to, there's a lot to take forward and explore. Um, and the RIS will definitely pick up on the, the tips uh, at the end there, Roger. So maybe we'll be in touch soon. Um, and I think it's, it's a really evolving area of knowledge as well. And I think there's a lot of coordination needed in this essentially between various established research bodies, you know, and, and the expertise we have here, for example, to kind of be ready for the challenge of retrofit on a, on a much bigger scale. So I think, you know, it helps to set some, some context and, and give us some really key guides for where to look going forward. Joseph, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just a quick one, just to say the, the ground has shifted so hugely and in such a positive way in the last six years, you know, just I'd say Roger would say the same, Chris would say the same, I'm, I'm hoping, um, 
you, you know, back in 2010, you couldn't get good guidance. There wasn't decent research. Um, the guidance was contrary. The, you know, policy levels were, were policy wasn't tied up. Um, it was a much poorer position. There is so much out there for you now, and so much of it is increasingly coherent. And go to organizations like Astar Scotland, go to organization, Environment Scotland, go to organizations like the STBA, the UK CBMB, the SPAB, um, who else? Uh, you know, the new BS5250 document when it, when it comes out in 2020. All, all of those different bodies, they're all now producing increasingly coherent guidance that's so supported. And there is so much research there from the EU and other bodies as well, from the different universities in the UK. Um, it's a good time to be building and doing it right. Uh, just, you know, use the resources. So we need to immerse ourselves, basically, is probably the last comment we, we need to leave on. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you again, obviously, uh, to Roger, Chris and Joseph for their time tonight. Also to Alex Little from the EAA for having, you know, the, the kind of for wanting to know more about the subject and, and opening up the can of worms that we have uh, this evening, uh, which is really exciting to kind of get a little bit more technical and, and look at this in, in, in detail. Um, and also to the Edinburgh Architectural Association team who put this evening together and also to the audience for your attendance and thank you for participating on the chat. Uh, there'll no doubt be more events coming up soon so watch out on the EAA website uh, for more information and, and thank you again to our speakers. Stay safe everyone and thank you for your time this evening. Good night. Bye.